Welcome everyone. I'll, um, I'm the, uh, the introduction person, the chair, I see I am. Uh, Kate McMillan's my name. I'm um, in charge of the probate list over at the Supreme Court. So I get to see the other end of what you're doing at the, uh, during the, the week. Um, I, it's a great pleasure to be here to introduce the speakers this morning. Um, originally we were three people. Um, we have uh, Peter Pascoe, Jeremy Smith, and we did have Simon Pitt, but unfortunately he's had to pull out uh, due to family reasons. So it would be Peter and Jeremy. Now, you probably all know Peter and Jeremy. They've been around for some time, like me. And uh, you also uh, will know of their reputation as quality advocates. <coughs> Peter has... Um, been around since, at the bar anyway, since 1988 and is a specialist in this area. Jeremy came to the bar a little bit later and um, each of them do a lot of work in this jurisdiction. I have the, had the pleasure of working with them and against them when I was at the bar and now I have the undoubted pleasure of having them appear before me and uh, on all occasions they are, have always been well prepared and um, push hard for their clients but know when to pull back. And I commend them to you. Uh, if you want to see a good example of drafting, just go straight to Peter Pascoe. He has an ability, in my view, uh, to no other, to be able to tell the story that's involved in the case that he's doing in a succinct way and clear. So I uh, am particularly admiring of his drafting ability. Jeremy and I were opposed in a case some years ago and it was a, like all of these wills cases and t type cases, an undue influence case and uh, it was hard fought but throughout it all we, I think, this is what I think anyway, uh, we, we fought hard for our clients but we always uh, were able to maintain a professional uh, relationship and respect each other in the way we ran the case. The first speaker is Jeremy and he's going to talk about uh, summary judgment applications. So I'll pass you over to Jeremy. Um, well, thank you, Your Honour, for those generous remarks and thank you all for turning up so early. The I've prepared a paper which has been handed out and I'm not going to go uh, through everything that's in it because the time doesn't really permit us to do that. But the, it's an interesting point at which to revisit a sequence of summary judgment applications in Part 4 claims. And the reason it's interesting is because there's a recent decision by the Court of Appeal concerning summary judgment more broadly and the true meaning of Section 63 of the Civil Procedure Act. Now, um, you, you'll all be very familiar with the fact that <clears throat> forever and a day you've been able to apply for summary judgment pursuant to the rules. And um, you can now, since the enactment of the Civil Procedure Act, you can now apply pursuant to Section 63. The, if I can refer to the rules uh, and the old test, if you like, uh, essentially you're arguing that a claim um, didn't disclose a cause of action, uh, alternatively that there was a good defence to a claim on the merits, and the question was, well, what standard does the court apply? And it was very well established in a sequence of high court cases <clears throat> um, and I've listed a couple of those in paragraph two. General Steele is the case most frequently referred to. And essentially, judgment's only given where a claim was hopeless or bound to fail. Uh, and everyone's familiar with that test. It's been the test for a very long time and it's been revisited time and again. The Civil Procedure Act was interesting because it appeared on the face of it to introduce a less stringent test. And what I mean by less stringent is that it appeared to make it easier to obtain summary judgment and dismiss an unmeritorious claim. Now, 
the, I've, I've set out the terms of section 63 at paragraph 3, and the test is that a claim, the plaintiff in applying to dismiss, sorry, the defendant in applying to dismiss the plaintiff's claim needs to demonstrate that the claim has no <coughs> real prospect of success. Now, compare that with the old test, hopeless or bound to fail. What's the difference? Um, the, uh, the High Court dealt with this question to some extent in 2010 in Spencer and Commonwealth. Uh, and in that case, which I've referred to in paragraph three, the, the court um, accepted what had become the uh, accepted wisdom, if you like, that what no real prospect of success meant was um, that a case had to have a real rather than a fanciful prospect of success. But if you read that judgment, and I should say in that case the court was considering a slightly different expression, no reasonable prospect of success rather than what we deal with, no real prospect. Um, when you read that decision, you have the impression that uh, notwithstanding what the court says, that the court is not entirely convinced that there's a great deal of difference between the new test and the old. Now, um, there were then a sequence in the, in the Supreme Court in this state, a sequence of judgments, and I've referred to two of them. One, a judgment of Just Justice Dixon uh, in Teddon and of Justice Jack Forrest in Matthews and SPI Electricity. And you'll see there, I've, I've extracted the parts of the judgment that really go to this question about the meaning of the new test. And um, Justice Dixon very helpfully set out in point form those six points there. And that, um, he observed that a claim which should be dismissed under the old test will be dismissed under the new test, obviously. Uh, and then he says at point two, section 63 is less stringent. Um, and what is required is a practical judgment by the court as to whether a claim has more than a fanciful prospect of success. Um, you can read the rest of those at your leisure, but uh, his honours really stated uh, the law as it stands and the law as it is frequently expressed. Um, his honour Justice Forrest similarly provides a short and punchy summary of the law. He also says at point three, which I think is interesting, the less complex the issue in a case, the easier it is for a court to take the view that such a proceeding is capable of being determined on summary judgment. Um, perhaps that goes without saying, but I think all of these remarks are helpful when you're turning your mind to whether a claim uh, perhaps can be the subject of a successful application. Um, so there's the accepted, the accepted wisdom about what what the test means. Um, however, last year in the Court of Appeal, and I've referred to this in paragraph seven, there was a case called Karam and Palmoni Shoes. And there was a judgment in that case of their honours justices of appeal, Nettle and Osborne. And the case came before the Court of Appeal. It was a rather torturous sequence of litigation and it arose by reason of uh, uh, an application by an enthusiastic plaintiff in the magistrate's court to have a defence struck out. He was unsuccessful. He appealed uh, and Her Honour Associate Justice Daly dismissed the appeal on pursuant to a Section 63 application by the defendant. So Her Honour exercised that power and knocked it out. Now, the, ultimately, it worked its way through to the Court of Appeal, where their honours dealt with it. And they were very focused on trying to track this, as I said, torturous sequence of litigation. They then came to a discussion, a very short discussion, of Section 63 and what it really means. And I've extracted the relevant part there on page four. They say, the change in terms was not intended to establish a new or different test rather to express more accurately the way in which the rule had been interpreted by the courts. Um, and they say, the power to order a summary judgment is to be exercised sparingly 
and not unless it's clear that there's no real question to be tried. So essentially, uh, Justices Nettle and Osborne are saying there's no difference. Um, that, I think, perhaps caused some confusion. And uh, a question of law was then referred to the Court of Appeal, this question of law, and it was dealt with in a recent decision earlier this year, which is Lysart Building Solutions, and I refer to this at paragraph eight. And in that, um, that decision, Justice, Chief Justice Warren and Justice of Appeal Nettle go through in very um, uh, thorough fashion the Law Reform Commission report that led to these changes, the various decisions that are relevant in other jurisdictions, and the, what's interesting is they look at the Law Reform Commission report and say, well, hang on, here's, here's what it said. It said the objective here is to liberalise the test. Um, the procedure should be used more frequently and flexibly to deal with claims that are unmeritorious. The court noted the English reforms, the where this had originated. Um, the court looked at the General Steel test, the hopeless bound to fail test, and said, well, what is the difference? Um, that is to say, can a claim that would have survived under the old test perish under the new test? And um, their honour said, it is difficult to conceive of such a case. Um, they said, it's hard to envisage circumstances in which there could be any difference between what's needed to demonstrate one or the other. And um, however, they say at paragraph 29, uh, the law is at present understood, the way the law is at present understood, the real chance of success test, so that's the new test, permits of the possibility that there may be cases yet to be identified in which it appears that although respondent's case is not hopeless or bound to fail, it doesn't have a real prospect of success. So their honours are saying there might be a case where you get a different result depending on which test, but um, such a case is yet to be identified. So it's a bit like the thylacine. Um, it could be out there, but no one's seen it. <laughs> now, the court then came to the, the preceding judgment in Carum and said, yes, there may have been some misunderstanding of what we meant there, or rather what um, uh, Justice, Justices Nettle and Osborne meant there. And they exp they, their honours explained that by saying it was an endeavour to emphasise that there appears to be little distinction in practical effect between the general steel test and the new test. Um, now, that's, that's by way of background, really, to the, the uh, topic today, which is focused on the application of these principles to Part 4 claims. But I think it's important to... Uh, turn one's mind to, to the test at the outset and how it's viewed. Um, I, I should say, and Simon Pitt's not here this morning, he's, he's an apology, but Simon pointed me also in that judgment to some comments at the end by Her Honour um, Justice of Appeal Neve. Now, I, I read the, the, um, the, plurality, the, the plurality judgment, Justice Neve agreed, but she wrote a very short separate judgment and It is worth uh, having a look at her honours comments because she said <coughs> she agreed with uh, Justices Nettle and the Chief Justice uh, and she said she referred in more detail to the Law Reform Commission report and its objectives. She said the Law Reform Commission was hoping to provoke a change in attitude and make parties more inclined to seek summary judgment and courts more prepared to grant them. So she put that up front and she then said um, she agreed with the Chief Justice and Justice Nettle about the need for caution in such applications and the courts are always saying you have to be very cautious about these applications. She said, nevertheless, I'm concerned that undue emphasis on caution runs the risk of reinforcing the historical approach to summary dismissal and may result in the legislative liberalisation of the test having little impact. 
That approach would be inconsistent with the objective of reforming the law relating to summary judgment expressed in the Civil Procedure Act and with the requirement that the court give effect to the overarching purposes of the Act. So Her Honour took the trouble to write that, uh, those additional comments because um, the court really is saying there's no change, nothing to see here, but at the same time Parliament has made it very clear that this is intended to be a more liberal test. So if you are running an application, um, I'd be taking the court to those comments by Her Honour Justice of Peel Neve <coughs> and reminding the court that this is in fact intended to be a more liberal test. Uh, which brings us to the brings us to the, uh, the part four cases. Now, I've summarised the cases that I'm aware of in this paper. Um, it starts really at paragraph 18 with Harrison Bennett back in 2002. That was a claim by a grandchild who had never met his grandfather, had nothing to do with his grandfather. There was indeed a great deal of debate about whether the grandfather knew this boy was in fact his grandchild. Um, Master Evans upheld a summary dismissal claim. Uh, Justice MacDonald on appeal reversed that decision and said, no, this matter should go to trial. Now, um, notwithstanding the breadth of, or the significance of the changes to the Act in 1998, there were no more summary judgment applications as far as I can tell until 2011. So it seemed that that decision of Justice MacDonald resonated uh, in a way that um, served to, to uh, warn people off making such claims. In any event, in 2011 there was a decision in Jackson and Nunes, and I presume a lot of you are familiar with that judgement. It's, it's worth reading. It's um, a very thorough judgement of Associate Justice Mukhtar, 65-year-old nephew, um, a state of about a million dollars. He got 250000 under the will, so he didn't get nothing. Um, the farm, which was the main asset, went to uh, a cousin. The, he had a very close relationship with the uncle as a child. He maintained the relationship as an adult. He used to go up there and stay with the uncle, work on the farm, that sort of thing. As he got older, he became a pharmacist. As he got older, things, uh, you know, he, his, his luck changed a bit and he, um, I think he may have had a separation and, and, and well, certainly wasn't a wealthy person. But the relationship really with his uncle fell away to the point where he would ring the uncle several times a year, but that was about it. And um, his honour uh, upheld the application to dismiss the claim. He said that, um, yes, summary dismissal in that such applications as these um, are rare and rare with good reason, but there's only one affidavit from the plaintiff the defendant accepts everything that's in the affidavit. That is the high watermark of the claim, and I'm in as good a position as a trial judge to, to assess the facts when they're presented in that fashion and they are not in dispute. The, he said the fact that uh, the plaintiff had been included in previous wills was not a recognition of the existence of a moral duty. Um, they had a yes, they had a good relationship, but that doesn't mean there's a moral duty the plaintiff's real grievance was that he didn't get the farm and the cousin did. So um, the claim was dismissed. Now, that caused, as I've said in the paper, that caused a lot of excitement. Uh, well, as, as, as much excitement as, as you might expect uh, a decision like that could cause. And then there was a sequence of applications which were considered by associate justices, and, and a lot of you will be familiar with these decisions. Um, and I've referred to them in the judgment there. There's Wallensack and Leone at paragraph 22. Uh, that was a claim by a sister. The claim by the sister in circumstances where the deceased had provided her with some financial support back in the, around 1980 when her <coughs> marriage uh, failed. 
She had also provided some support around 1988, um, but the extent of the support was unclear. It was unclear whether any support at all had been provided in the last 20 years, and I think that's what the defendant honed in on. The, Her Honour Associate Justice Zamet said, well, uh, the evidence is equivocal, nevertheless the court's not satisfied that the claim should be dismissed. Um, it strikes me reading that judgment as an extremely cautious decision and the sort of decision that perhaps if um, the comments of Justice Neve were taken on board may have been decided differently. And I'd make the same comment in relation to a number of these judgments which follow. Um, this story against Simmons, uh, that was a granddaughter claim with no children, uh, good salary, $150,000. You'll see the, the situation outlined at um, paragraph 25. Home worth 750,000, mortgage 235,000. She's aged 40. Uh, unremarkable relationship with the grandparent. Now, uh, that claim for summary, summary judgment was dismissed, was unsuccessful as well. Uh, and the court, it's a, um, it's a very considered judgment uh, and referred to Petruchian Fields and Berkelmans and Bullock, which are, you know, again, um, granddaughter claims. I think Berkelmans is a daughter. But uh, interestingly, this one went on appeal before Justice Macaulay. And Justice Macaulay upheld the decision of the Associate Justice. And uh, there's not a judgment, not a written there are no written reasons, uh, but I understand that Justice Macaulay said that such applications as part fours are particularly unsuited to summary judgment applications. The next one is Webb and Ryan, and Webb and Ryan is an interesting one because it's a claim by six plaintiffs, two parents and their four children, on the estate of the late business partner of the father. So it's not a family relationship, it's a friend and business partner. It's a claim by the parents and their children. They, the business partners had known each other since the 1960s. They'd worked together in the 70s, bought a business in the 90s, uh, worked closely in the business. The kids worked in the business. The kids really looked up to the parent, the, the deceased as a mentor and a friend and I, I suppose an uncle. Um, and uh, the deceased died and they made this claim. Uh, Her Honour Associate Justice Zamet dealt with the application for summary judgment. She said that the claim did not sit comfortably with cases determined by the court since 1997 amendments, um, sits at the very margin and so on. So making all the right noises for a positive outcome for the defendant in that case. However, um, the problem here was that the defendant had waited until all of the affidavit material had been served, 23 affidavits from the defendant, nine from the plaintiff. And Her Honour said no, a summary judgment claim, a summary judgment application at that stage of proceedings uh, is entirely inappropriate. It's a misuse of the summary judgment procedure. So she didn't really deal with the merits of the claim. So there's a lesson in, in that. If you're going to make an application, make it early. The, um, the matter went to trial before Justice Whelan, who dispatched the claim and dismissed it. And it said it fell well short of establishing a moral duty. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm running out of time. There are... I've, I've referred to a couple of other judgments, Colville and Edmonds which is another failed application, um, which is a decision of Associate Justice Randall. And then there's uh, Napolitano and State Trustees, and this is really a bookend with, uh, with Jackson and Nunes, because Jackson and Nunes succeeded. This application in Napolitano succeeded. It was again a judgment of Associate Justice Mukhtar. It was again a claim by a nephew. This time the nephew, he was nephew by marriage, I should add, he got nothing under the will. 
he was a hopeless case. He was, uh, had psychological problems. I think he'd, he'd meddled in drugs. Uh, I've, I've set out a fairly comprehensive summary of the case. And you can, uh, you can read that at your leisure. By way of conclusion, can I say, make, make a couple of points. The, it, it appears that very little has changed with the new test. Um, however, as I said a moment ago, I would, if you're running such an application, I would certainly make the court aware of the comments of uh, Her Honour Justice of Appeal Neve. The two decisions of Associate Justice Mukhtar merit close scrutiny. Um, they demonstrate that a claim can succeed, sorry, an application for summary judgment can succeed in this jurisdiction. The key, I think, to a successful application is very, very close scrutiny of the plaintiff's affidavit. Uh, quite often you will get a claim made with only one affidavit. Sometimes when you dismantle the affidavit and put it all in chronological order, you'll find that there are extensive periods where the relationship, there is no reference at all to what happened. So if there's only one affidavit, look at it very, very closely. Uh, if the application is going to be made, make it early. Don't put on your own material. Make it as soon as possible. There may be circumstances where you would put on material to establish an incontrovertible fact, but certainly don't put on material that causes a factual dispute because you won't succeed. Uh, Jones and Dunkel has a role to play. In Napolitano, the last case, uh, his honour pointed to the fact that the plaintiff's mother was in a position to give evidence about a lot of the factual matters in this case and had not done so. So if uh, the plaintiff's mother wouldn't give evidence in his favour, that says a lot, but the rule in Jones and Dunkelk had a role to play there. And um, before you go rushing off to make an application for summary judgment, be aware of what I've described in the paper as decisions that are at the margins. Sinclair and Forsyth, a de facto case from, uh, I think, four years ago, Court of Appeal Judgment, Justice of Appeal Redlick said this case is at the margins. A lot of claims seem to get up which are, as I say, um, really uh, at the margins. You look at them and think, surely that claim can't succeed? Well, quite often they do. So beware of just, just remember, you can have a look through all of those judgments and find cases that are generally analogous, in, at least in broad terms, and just beware that sometimes they do get up. Um, but my last comment is take heart from the decision of uh, Her Honour in Larkin and Borg, where a claim by uh, a mistress earlier this year was, was um, dismissed by Her Honour, and it was quite a refreshing change. Thank you.